Logos UK, US, Ancient Greek, Logos translate. Logos, from Lego, Lego, lit, I say is a term in Western philosophy, psychology, rhetoric, and religion derived from a Greek word variously meaning ground, plea, opinion, expectation, word, speech, account, reason, proportion, and discourse. But it became a technical term in Western philosophy beginning with Heraclitus, c. 535 c. 475 BC, who used the term for a principle of order and knowledge. Logos is the logic behind an argument. Logos tries to persuade an audience using logical arguments and supportive evidence. Logos is a persuasive technique often used in writing and rhetoric. Ancient Greek philosophers used the term in different ways. The sophists used the term to mean discourse, Aristotle applied the term to refer to reasoned discourse, or the argument, in the field of rhetoric, and considered it one of the three modes of persuasion alongside ethos and pathos. Stoic philosophers identified the term with the divine animating principle pervading the universe. Within Hellenistic Judaism, Philo of Alexandria c. 20 BC, c. 50 AD, adopted the term into Jewish philosophy. The Gospel of John identifies the Logos, through which all things are made, as divine theos, and further identifies Jesus Christ as the incarnate Logos. The term is also used in Sufism, and the analytical psychology of Carl Jung. Despite the conventional translation as, word, it is not used for a word in the grammatical sense, instead, the term lexis, lexis lexis was used. However, both Logos and lexis derive from the same verb lego, lego meaning, I count, tell, say, speak. Author and professor Jean Fonstock describes logos as a premise. She states that, to find the reason behind a reader's backing of a certain position or stance, one must acknowledge the different premises that the reader applies via his or her chosen diction. The reader's success, she argues, will come down to certain objects of agreement between arguer and audience. Logos is logical appeal, and the term logic is derived from it. It is normally used to describe facts and figures that support the speaker's topic. Furthermore, logos is credited with appealing to the audience's sense of logic, with the definition of logic being concerned with the thing as it is known. Furthermore, one can appeal to this sense of logic in two ways. The first is through inductive reasoning, providing the audience with relevant examples and using them to point back to the overall statement. The second is through deductive enthymeme, providing the audience with general scenarios and then indicating commonalities among them. Philo distinguished between logos perforikos, the uttered word, and the logos endiathetos, the word remaining within. The Stoics also spoke of the Logos Spermaticos the generative principle of the universe which foreshadows related concepts in Neoplatonism. Early translators of the Greek New Testament such as Jerome in the 4th century AD were frustrated by the inadequacy of any single Latin word to convey the meaning of the word Logos as used to describe Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John. The Vulgate Bible usage of in principio erat verbum was thus constrained to use the perhaps inadequate noun verbum for word. But later Romance language translations had the advantage of nouns such as Lameau in French. Reformation translators took another approach. Martin Luther rejected Zeitwort verb in favor of Wart word, for instance, although later commentators repeatedly turned to a more dynamic use involving the living word as felt by Jerome and Augustine. Topic: <laughs> Ancient Greek philosophy. Heraclitus The writing of Heraclitus c. 535 c. 475 BC was the first place where the word logos was given special attention in ancient Greek philosophy, although Heraclitus seems to use the word with a meaning not significantly different from the way in which it was used in ordinary Greek of his time. For Heraclitus, logos provided the link between rational discourse and the world's rational structure. This logos holds always but humans always prove unable to ever understand it, both before hearing it and when they have first heard it. For though all things come to be in accordance with this logos, humans are like the inexperienced when they experience such words and deeds as I set out, distinguishing each in accordance with its nature and saying how it is. 
but other people fail to notice what they do when awake, just as they forget what they do while asleep. For this reason it is necessary to follow what is common. But although the logos is common, most people live as if they had their own private understanding. Listening not to me but to the logos it is wise to agree that all things are one. What logos means here is not certain, it may mean reason or explanation in the sense of an objective cosmic law, or it may signify nothing more than saying or wisdom. Yet, an independent existence of a universal logos was clearly suggested by Heraclitus. Aristotle identifies two specific types of persuasion methods, artistic and inartistic. He defines artistic proofs as arguments that the reader generates and creates on their own. Examples of these include relationships, testimonies, and conjugates. He defines inartistic proofs as arguments that the reader quotes using information from a non-self-generated source. Examples of these include laws, contracts, and oaths. Topic: <laughs> Aristotle's rhetorical logos. Following one of the other meanings of the word, Aristotle gave logos a different technical definition in the rhetoric, using it as meaning argument from reason, one of the three modes of persuasion. The other two modes are pathos, 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 which refers to persuasion by means of emotional appeal, putting the hearer into a certain frame of mind, and ethos, 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 persuasion through convincing listeners of one's moral character. According to Aristotle, logos relates to the speech itself, insofar as it proves or seems to prove. In the words of Paul Rahe, For Aristotle, logos is something more refined than the capacity to make private feelings public, it enables the human being to perform as no other animal can, it makes it possible for him to perceive and make clear to others through reasoned discourse the difference between what is advantageous and what is harmful, between what is just and what is unjust, and between what is good and what is evil. Logos, pathos, and ethos can all be appropriate at different times. Arguments from reason logical arguments have some advantages, namely that data are ostensibly difficult to manipulate, so it is harder to argue against such an argument, and such arguments make the speaker look prepared and knowledgeable to the audience, enhancing ethos. On the other hand, trust in the speaker—built through ethos— Enhances the appeal of arguments from reason. Robert Wardy suggests that what Aristotle rejects in supporting the use of logos is not emotional appeal per se, but rather emotional appeals that have no bearing on the issue, in that the path, path, path they stimulate lack, or at any rate are not shown to possess any intrinsic connection with the point at issue. As if an advocate were to try to whip an anti-Semitic audience into a fury because the accused is Jewish, or as if another in drumming up support for a politician were to exploit his listeners as reverential feelings for the politician's ancestors." Aristotle comments on the three modes by stating, Persuasion is clearly a sort of demonstration, since we are most fully persuaded when we consider a thing to have been demonstrated. Of the modes of persuasion furnished by the spoken word there are three kinds. Persuasion is achieved by the speaker's personal character when the speech is so spoken as to make us think him credible. Secondly, persuasion may come through the hearers, when the speech stirs their emotions. Thirdly, persuasion is effected through the speech itself when we have proved a truth or an apparent truth by means of the persuasive arguments suitable to the case in question. Topic. Stoics. Stoic philosophy began with Zeno of Citium c. 300 BC, in which the Logos was the active reason pervading and animating the universe. It was conceived as material and is usually identified with God or nature. The Stoics also referred to the seminal Logos, Logos Spermaticos, or the law of generation in the universe, which was the principle of the active reason working in inanimate matter. Humans, too, each possess a portion of the divine logos. The Stoics took all activity to imply a logos or spiritual principle. As the operative principle of the world, the logos was anima mundi to them, a concept which later influenced Philo of Alexandria, although he derived the contents of the term from Plato. In his introduction to the 1964 edition of Marcus Aurelius' Meditations, the Anglican priest Maxwell Staniforth wrote that, Logos. 
had long been one of the leading terms of Stoicism, chosen originally for the purpose of explaining how deity came into relation with the universe. Isocrates logos Public discourse on ancient Greek rhetoric has historically emphasized Aristotle's appeals to logos, pathos, and ethos, while less attention has been directed to Isocrates' teachings about philosophy and logos, and their partnership in generating an ethical, mindful polis. Isocrates does not provide a single definition of logos in his work, but Isocratian logos characteristically focuses on speech, reason, and civic discourse. He was concerned with establishing the common good of Athenian citizens, which he believed could be achieved through the pursuit of philosophy and the application of logos. In Hellenistic Judaism In the Septuagint the term logos is used for the word of God in the creation of heaven in Psalm chapter 33 verse 6, and in some related contexts. Philo of Alexandria Philo c. 20 BC, c. 50 AD, a Hellenized Jew, used the term logos to mean an intermediary divine being or demiurge. Philo followed the Platonic distinction between imperfect matter and perfect form, and therefore intermediary beings were necessary to bridge the enormous gap between God and the material world. The Logos was the highest of these intermediary beings, and was called by Philo, the firstborn of God. Philo also wrote that the Logos of the living God is the bond of everything, holding all things together and binding all the parts, and prevents them from being dissolved and separated. Plato's theory of forms was located within the Logos, but the Logos also acted on behalf of God in the physical world. In particular, the angel of the Lord in the Hebrew Bible Old Testament was identified with the Logos by Philo, who also said that the Logos was God's instrument in the creation of the universe. Christianity In Christology, the Logos Greek, Logos lit. Word. Quote, comma, quote, discourse. Or. Reason is a name or title of Jesus Christ, seen as the pre-existent second person of the Trinity. The concept derives from John chapter 1 verse 1, which in the Douay Rheims, King James, New International, and other versions of the Bible, reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the translations, Word is used for logos, although the term is often used transliterated but untranslated in theological discourse. The Koine Greek reads, N -rk -n -ho logos kai ho logos n pros tun theon kai theos n ho logos n -rk -n -ho logos, kai ho logos n pros tun theon, kai theos n ho logos, the definite article is used with theos, God, making it God, and the second usage is indefinite without an article, rendering it God. Thus David Bentley Hart translates it as in the origin there was the Logos, and the Logos was present with God, and the Logos was God. However, many ancient Greek scholars, including Dr. Bruce M. Metzger of Princeton, professor of New Testament language and literature, explains that concepts of definite articles in English and Koine Greek are not similar. In the New World Translation the opening verse of the Gospel according to John is mistranslated as follows, originally the Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, a footnote which is added to the first word, originally, reads, literally, in at a beginning, by using here the indefinite article a the translators have overlooked the well-known fact that in Greek grammar nouns may be definite for various reasons, whether or not the Greek definite article is present. A prepositional phrase, for example, where the definite article is not expressed, can be quite definite in Greek. In Hebrew 10:31, "Ice cheris theosantos" is properly rendered, even by the New World Translation, with the definite article expressed twice, into the hands of the living God, as in fact it is in John chapter 1, verse 1. Topic: <laughs> Rima. The word logos has been used in different senses along with rima. 
Both Plato and Aristotle used the term logos along with rima to refer to sentences and propositions. The Septuagint translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek uses the terms rima and logos as equivalents and uses both for the Hebrew word dabar, as the word of God. Some modern usage in Christian theology distinguishes rima from logos, which here refers to the written scriptures, while rima refers to the revelation received by the reader from the Holy Spirit when the word logos is read, although this distinction has been criticized. Neoplatonism Neoplatonist philosophers such as Plotinus c. AD used the term «logos» in ways that drew on Plato and the Stoics, but the term logos was interpreted in different ways throughout Neoplatonism, and similarities to Philo's concept of logos appear to be accidental. The logos was a key element in the meditations of Plotinus regarded as the first Neoplatonist. Plotinus referred back to Heraclitus and as far back as Thales in interpreting Logos as the principle of meditation, existing as the interrelationship between the hypostasis—the soul, the intellect nous, and the one. Plotinus used a trinity concept that consisted of the one, the spirit, and soul. The comparison with the Christian trinity is inescapable, but for Plotinus these were not equal and the one was at the highest level, with the soul at the lowest. For Plotinus, the relationship between the three elements of his trinity is conducted by the outpouring of logos from the higher principle, and eros loving upward from the lower principle. Plotinus relied heavily on the concept of logos, but no explicit references to Christian thought can be found in his works, although there are significant traces of them in his doctrine. Plotinus specifically avoided using the term logos to refer to the second person of his trinity. However, Plotinus influenced Gaius Marius Victorinus, who then influenced Augustine of Hippo. Centuries later, Carl Jung acknowledged the influence of Plotinus in his writings. Victorinus differentiated between the Logos interior to God and the Logos related to the world by creation and salvation. Augustine of Hippo, often seen as the father of medieval philosophy, was also greatly influenced by Plato and is famous for his re interpretation of Aristotle and Plato in the light of early Christian thought. A young Augustine experimented with, but failed to achieve ecstasy using the meditations of Plotinus. In his Confessions, Augustine described Logos as the divine eternal word, by which he, in part, was able to motivate the early Christian thought throughout the Hellenized world of which the Latin-speaking West was a part Augustine's Logos had taken body in Christ, the man in whom the Logos i.e. Veritas or Sapientia was present as in no other man. Islam The concept of the Logos also exists in Islam, where it was definitively articulated primarily in the writings of the classical Sunni mystics and Islamic philosophers, as well as by certain Shia thinkers, during the Islamic Golden Age. In Sunni Islam, the concept of the Logos has been given many different names by the denominations metaphysicians, mystics, and philosophers, including Aql intellect. Al-Insan al-Kamil, universal man, Kalimat Allah, word of God, Hakika Muhammadiyah, the Muhammadan reality, and Nur Muhammadi, the Muhammadan light. Topic <laughs> AQL. One of the names given to a concept very much like the Christian logos by the classical Muslim metaphysicians is AQL, which is the Arabic equivalent to the Greek nous intellect. In the writings of the Islamic Neoplatonist philosophers, such as Al-Farabi c. 872 c. 950 AD and Avicenna d. 1037, the idea of the AQL was presented in a manner that both resembled the late Greek doctrine and, likewise, corresponded in many respects to the Logos Christology. The concept of Logos in Sufism is used to relate the uncreated God to the created humanity. In Sufism, for the deist, no contact between man and God can be possible without the Logos. The Logos is everywhere and always the same, but its personification is unique within each region. Jesus and Muhammad are seen as the personifications of the Logos, and this is what enables them to speak in such absolute terms. One of the boldest and most radical attempts to reformulate the Neoplatonic concepts into Sufism arose with the philosopher Ibn Arabi, who traveled widely in Spain and North Africa. 
His concepts were expressed in two major works the Ringstones of Wisdom and the Meccan Illuminations al al To Ibn Arabi, every prophet corresponds to a reality which he called a logos kalima, as an aspect of the unique divine being. In his view the divine being would have forever remained hidden, had it not been for the prophets, with Logos providing the link between man and divinity. Ibn Arabi seems to have adopted his version of the Logos concept from Neoplatonic and Christian sources, although, writing in Arabic rather than Greek, he used more than twenty different terms when discussing it. For Ibn Arabi, the Logos or universal man was a mediating link between individual human beings and the divine essence. Other Sufi writers also show the influence of the Neoplatonic Logos. In the 15th century, Abd al Karim al Jili introduced the doctrine of Logos and the perfect man. For al Jili, the perfect man associated with the Logos or the Holy Prophet has the power to assume different forms at different times and to appear in different guises. In Ottoman Sufism, Say Ghalib d. 1799 articulates Suhan Logos Kalima in his Husn you ask beauty and love in parallel to Ibn Arabi's Kalima. In the Romance, Suhan appears as an embodiment of Kalima as a reference to the Word of God, the perfect man, and the reality of Muhammad. Jung's analytical psychology Carl Jung contrasted the critical and rational faculties of Logos with the emotional, non-reason-oriented and mythical elements of Eros. In Jung's approach, Logos versus Eros can be represented as science versus mysticism, or reason versus imagination, or conscious activity versus the unconscious. For Jung, Logos represented the masculine principle of rationality, in contrast to its female counterpart, Eros. Woman's psychology is founded on the principle of Eros, the great binder and loosener, whereas from ancient times the ruling principle ascribed to man is Logos. The concept of Eros could be expressed in modern terms as psychic relatedness, and that of Logos as objective interest. Jung attempted to equate Logos and Eros, his intuitive conceptions of masculine and feminine consciousness, with the alchemical Sol and Luna. Jung commented that in a man the lunar anima and in a woman the solar animus has the greatest influence on consciousness. Jung often proceeded to analyze situations in terms of paired opposites e.g. by using the analogy with the Eastern yin and yang and was also influenced by the Neoplatonists. In his book Mysterium Conjunctionis Jung made some important final remarks about anima and animus. Insofar as the spirit is also a kind of window on eternity. It conveys to the soul a certain influx divineness and the knowledge of a higher system of the world, wherein consists precisely its supposed animation of the soul. And in this book Jung again emphasized that the animus compensates eros, while the anima compensates logos. <laughs> See also